Hello, I'm Kim Roberts, the Interim Associate Director of the Security Studies Program here at Georgetown. I would like to welcome you all here tonight to listen to a fascinating discussion on building a community of national security entrepreneurs. SSP's Hacking for Defense seminar and the, Pen the Pentagon's MD5 National Security Technology Accelerator have come together tonight to talk about the extraordinary need to align the nation's defense community. The combination of government, the private sector, and academia will enable the country to, pers to pursue the most comprehensive and successful national security strategy. These communities must work together to ensure that the United States and its allies remain at the forefront of technology and innovation today and in the decades to come. Our moderator for this evening will be Chris Taylor. Chris is an adjunct professor here at Georgetown who is running the Hacking for Defense seminar. Chris is the CEO of Govini, a big data and analytics company. He spent 14 years in the United States Marine Corps as an enlisted infantryman and force recon Marine. Chris holds an MBA from the College of William and Mary. He is also a graduate of the Harvard Kennedy School where he earned a Master of Public Administration degree in political economy and international security. So I want to thank you all for coming here tonight and Chris, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Kim. Good evening. Can you hear me okay? Welcome to Georgetown, uh, America's oldest Jesuit and Catholic university. You are sitting in the iconic uh, Gaston Hall, a landmark uh, that was finished in 1901. Um, so welcome. This is a, a great venue to have this uh, chat. You all have programs and you can see the bios uh, of everyone, but I just want to just quickly introduce as we go down the line, just so you can keep everybody straight. <laughs> On the far end is uh, Major General Bob Scales, um, retired after 33 years in the Army, um, was the Commandant of the Army War College, and is currently on Secretary Mattis's um, Combat Lethality uh, Task Force Advisory Board. Bob, thanks for being here. Thank you. Uh, Elsa Kanye is next to him. Uh, Elsa's a young and impressive and important voice, particularly around artificial intelligence and China. Um, if you've read any of her stuff, um, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you haven't, you should start reading it tonight when you leave, mm -hmm. when you leave uh, the room. So thank you, Elsa, for being here. Thank you, it's great to be here. Thank you. Uh, so uh, next to Elsa is Major General Kim Kreider. She's the Chief Data Officer uh, of the Air Force. Small job, there's not a lot to do there, uh, <laughs> but, but, she's, but she's here. Uh, it's a huge job, and uh, Kim, thanks for being here, appreciate it. Next to her is Dr. Will Roper. Uh, Dr. Roper is the Assistant Secretary of the Air Force for Acquisition Technology and Logistics. And for those of you who follow um, what the, this industry and the defense enterprise, he was previously the Director of the Strategic Capabilities Office, better known as SCO. Thanks, Will, for being here. Uh, Dawn Myricks is next. She is the Deputy Director CIA for Science and Technology. Again, small job, there's not a lot going on there. <laughs> Um, but she's here to share a lot uh, tonight about how um, the CIA works in innovation with the, uh, with the National Security Innovation Base. So Don, thank you for being here. Uh, next to Don is General Denis Mercier. He's the Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation at NATO. He's a French Air Force officer uh, and um, has, I I'm very happy to have him here because we've spent some time together recently talking about how NATO um, can embrace uh, new innovation uh, amongst its 29 members. So it's difficult for us to do it for one member. Imagine what it's like doing it for 29. That's true. <laughs> uh, next to uh, General Mercier is the one and only Assistant Secretary of the Navy for Research Development and Acquisition, James, quote unquote, Hondo Gertz. Um, to the entire defense enterprise, he's simply known as Hondo, uh, and we're glad to have him here tonight. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, next to Hondo is uh, Major General John Jansen, who's the Commandant of the Dwight D. Eisenhower School of National Security uh, and Resource Strategy at NDU. I always get the last part wrong, but I'm good to go. Um, equally, I've had some very interesting conversations with John over the last uh, month, and I thought it was great that he, would, uh, that he could be here tonight to talk to us. Next is our co-sponsor. 
uh, Mr. Morgan Plummer, who is the managing director of MD5, which is the Pentagon's National Security Technology Accelerator. And they live uh, under uh, acquisition tech, uh, under Secretary of Defense, ATNL, uh, but actually under MIBP, Manufacturing Industrial Based Policy Office. Is that right? Did I get right. that all right? That's right. That's right. I uh, I work for them, so I hope I got that right. <laughs> I don't want Eric to call me up and say, what are you doing, man? <laughs> so let's set the stage for this evening. You can't pick up any newspaper or watch any newscast um, without reading something about great power competition, the return of great power competition. Um, certainly in, the tech, uh, in technology, but in other modes of transformation as well. Um, as America continues to try and drive uh, forward the distance and speed it has between uh, herself and, and our great power competitors, uh, it takes a lot. And we, we're technically spending a fair amount of money on being able to do that. So tonight, we're going to talk about it. I'll just start off by asking, um, I, I'm going I'm to pick the fight early. So um, Bob, we had an exchange, you and I, over email. I won't tell everybody what that was. That was private between okay. you and I. Um, but, you know, one of the things you said to me is that, hey, look, all this talk about um, innovation seems to be wrapped around ones or zeros and soon ones and zeros. What about the stuff that's not that? And as, as a member of the, of the Secretary's uh, combat or lethal combat task force, how are you, and perhaps by proxy, the secretary looking at transformation on a larger scale rather than just technology? Yeah, that's a great question, and thank you for picking on me first. Uh, <laughs> the secretary and I started our relationship back in 2004 when he left command of the 1st Infantry Division uh, in Fallujah. Uh, and I'd written a book back then called Yellow, titled Yellow Smoke, and, and, that, and the theme of the book was that warfare is more than just a clash of machines and that the greatest single leap in effectiveness and combat effectiveness perhaps is less in the technological domain and more in the human domain. In fact, one chapter that caught his attention was one titled Tactics in the Human Dimension. Um, and, and since then, what we've seen has been a virtual explosion in our ability to exploit the human, behavioral, cognitive, cultural sciences in the application to, uh, to national security. It's been astounding. Uh, the number of instruments, the amount of research that's done in brain science, uh, in psychology, sociology, and so forth, driven in large part by wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, where in many ways culture uh, is a more effective weapon uh, than, uh, than bombs. The problem is that there is a huge rift between physical scientists and human scientists. And within the human community, there's an enormous rift between the human sciences and the study of warfare. And what we've tried to do over the past few years and what we're trying to do now uh, is to close those gaps. And virtually everybody on this stage today is a physical scientist. I'm a well, I'm a historian, so I don't, I'm not anything, but, but, but what's, I think what's important here is that we're, we're, we're viewing a new dawn where training, selection, acculturization, leadership, decision-making, uh, all of those things that are previously viewed as soft sciences have now begun to come to the fore. And in our project, the Close Combat Lethality Task Force, uh, I would say, so far at least, at least 60% of the funding and the effort that we're putting into this is not in the physical sciences, but it's in the human, cultural, cognitive sciences. So I'm asking you in the audience uh, who are interested in this and in closing the gap between, uh, between <laughs> these, two, these two bodies of knowledge to go online and check us out and contact me. Because, as I said, this is a new beginning, I hope, a new beginning. And the largest gain, return on investment for the smallest amount of money in the shortest time, in my estimation, is in the human dimension, not in the physical dimension. Thank you. Not that I have strong feelings about any of this. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
let me connect that to John Jansen's work at NDU. Um, you, you're reimagining the curriculum for your, for your uh, school. You are focused on great power competition and how America can respond. Your students come from the private sector, the civilian uh, 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 DOD and government sector, and the military. How are you thinking about what Bob just said as you start to think about what your new curriculum will look like? Because as I think you said to me in a conversation, you actually are creating your, your, your OSD's policy, policy shop, right? You're, you're, you're creating the vehicle by which they will all be schooled in this way. So talk, talk a little bit how you're reimagining that. Well, I think the first thing, uh, connecting it to uh, General Scale's comments, is, is that that's as close as I've heard of somebody imagining the force of the future in a coherent way. Um, so the Eisenhower School is really uh, about, uh, at its essence, re essence resourcing national security. Um, I, I will tell you, to, I'll get to that in a second, but the, the concept of innovation right now and how our great nation uh, feeds national security is a little bit broken, right? And so in the, uh, to the degree that um, We've got a $19 trillion economy uh, and uh, brilliant Americans and hardworking people uh, with all the ingenuity in the world. Uh, we should be way out in front of anybody on, on the planet, but we're not. Um, uh, I will tell you from a, an innovation perspective inside the DOD, uh, we're, we're not only incoherent because we don't have a clear vision of what the force of the future looks like, although the, the intel community and futurists have pretty well given us some ideas about future operating environments. Um, we're in a period right now that's probably gonna last for a couple of years. And a lot of people on this stage are involved in the work that, that simply has a force that's been involved in conventional warfare and counterinsurgency warfare for 15 years. And we just kind of came up out of it and we looked around and we're like, hey, what is all that new stuff? Uh, what is all this AI stuff? And what is all this innovation and how do we use it? Uh, but it's very episodic in how we apply it. It's applied uh, to, to problems and so forth. But in a great power competition now, so that was, that predated the, the recent national security strategy and that's been going on for the past couple, three years. A lot of people up on this stage have been doing some great work. But you imagine in a great power competition how we take innovation and, uh, and collect for ourselves, our great nation's strategic advantage uh, that ensures that we don't have to fight, that we get to some period, this uh, position of strategic overmatch now and in the future. And um, we have made it very hard uh, in our nation for us to work with us. And so if it's all about resourcing national security, you ask, how is it that we incentivize uh, commerce in America to contribute and provide for national security? And we don't, we disincentivize it. Uh, so, you know, you look, at, uh, you look at DOD out there right now trying to look around and, and, and try to find solutions to problems, uh, but that's all very much at the tactical level. At a great power competition level, um, until we get to the place where we stop with a war on price, a war on profit, a war on intellectual property, uh, and we, uh, we make it so that doing business with the federal government uh, isn't a very painful uh, proposition by way of all the rules and regulations at very low margins compared to everything else, um, we are not going to succeed in a great power competition. I'll wrap it up by saying that right now, uh, it's 1936 to 1940, all over again. Uh, so if you go back and you look at, at uh, read uh, Freedom's Forge, mm -hmm. uh, and, and read what it took to reimagine not just the manufacturing base uh, of the United States, but it was really the business rules uh, of what it took to get uh, our commerce to participate in national security. Because until we get to that, until we get to a national security strategy to secure the innovation base and make viable the industrial base, we're not gonna win this great power competition. And that, that strategy is encumbered by policy. And that policy is written in executive orders, it's written in statutes, and it's written in regulations from departments and agencies in the federal government. And right now, it is not a great uh, business proposition, uh, and that's what we're gonna have to uh, rewrite. Last thing I'll tell you, if you wanna, everybody in this room has a, a moral imperative to read a book uh, called This Kind of War by T.R. Fairbach. So if you wanna look, if you wanna take a look at what failure looks like for the United States, read that book. 
uh, and in the span of, uh, of four short years, uh, we put ourselves in a position where uh, we got it put to us pretty good by the North Koreans and then by the Chinese. Uh, it is a painful read, but it is a, it is a look at what uh, failure looks like. So 1936 to 1940, take a look at uh, June of 1950 through about December of 1950, uh, and then take a look at the current uh, policies of the United States and figure out how we're going to write that to incentivize uh, American industry, the innovation base, and so forth to participate in the common defense of this great nation. And that's kind of some of the work we're about. So I don't think I understood all the points because you were beating around the bush. <laughs> um, but, I, but I got it, I think. Um, so it's interesting. You're talking about some interesting things about, about um, policy. So, I mean, Will and Hondo, you both are, are leading um, the acquisition and much larger efforts, quite frankly, in your respective services. How do you comment on what General uh, Jansen was just talking about? And then I want to bring in Don because I want to know, I want to talk about how the agency is also thinking about this uh, to compare and contrast. So Will, Hondo, uh, Will go first if you want. Sure, it's a, I mean, it's an interesting time to be in acquisition just because it's rare to be given a very clear national defense strategy that says go after peer competition, to have budgets going up, and to have aligned leadership that say, yes, it's time to change now. So we really couldn't be in these positions at a better time. I know, I know Hondo's uh, just as enthousi enthusiastic as I am, but uh, what I'm really trying to do are a couple of things. Um, the, the industry base is really important to take in mind when you consider acquisition. And it's changed, everyone knows it's changed, but you know, back in the period of World War II, military systems and domestic systems, commercial systems, were much closer together. A tank was not that dissimilar to an automobile, so you could surge and build tanks in automobile manufacturing base. But what's happened since then, military systems have continued to move away from the industry base that has gone in a different direction, more digitally based. And so one of the things that I'm encouraging all of our Air Force programs to do is to try to re-vector to take advantage of commercial technology. And that, that's likely to lead to a very different kind of Air Force. You could imagine us continuing on building more exquisite airplanes after airplane, and eventually the Air Force budget just builds one plane, uh, you know, immaculately conceived, um, that we share across the service. The but that's not the direction that commercial tech is going, right? We would have to put extreme investment into signature management and engines and things that are peculiar to us. The other direction are low cost systems that work together, that are driven by software, that can learn, that can evolve. And basically taking what we, we once put in a single system and breaking it up and making a team of things that can do the same job but in a different way. And the technology base to do that is not in question. It's all around us, we, and we brought pieces of it with us into this room. The challenge we have is the cultural challenge, and it's, it, there's always a reason to say today is not today. And so rather than jump to that all in one, one fell swoop, we're trying to basically find the midpoint between. We have legacy systems today. We can imagine a very different kind of Air Force in future. So how do we wrap the Air Force we have today with a piece of that future that enables it to do new things? How do we have aircraft that we can't take risk with, teamed with low-cost drones that we can, and enable a completely different kind of, of fighting conops, but one that is closer tied to the industry base that we see in this country? And so I'm finding that the latter is, is, a, is a good place to begin because it's bringing in the future, but in a way that you can sell in this town. Mm. And, if you, and if you don't think you have to mind the politics in these jobs, you do. Mm. It's a variable just like cost schedule performance, and it's better to fight for a 90% piece of the future than, uh, than saying you have to have 100% on your soapbox but be standing alone. Uh, uh, thank you for mentioning the politics piece because <laughs> those of us who either work um, uh, inside the building or in the industry uh, see it all the time. And it, it is, if you're not paying attention, it can roll you over. Sure. Uh, so that, I mean, spot on. I, I particularly like the part about get, finding the midpoint so that you're not uh, 
crushing it, trying to swing too hard for the fences right away and blow your, all your chances of doing anything fantastic. I hate to say that we have to bring common sense to acquisition, <laughs> but uh, it is missing. Well, <laughs> speaking of common sense and acquisition, Hondo. <laughs> or lack thereof. Or lack thereof. Well, look, let, let's face it. When you were at SOCOM, you were also the head of acquisitions at, at SOCOM. Um, you are known far and wide as being the guy that redesigned SOCOM acquisitions to great, great applause around, uh, certainly by operators. Um, and now you're in the Navy. It's a different organization. Um, connect sort of what Will was talking about to what's, what you're doing in the Navy and sure. your experience at SOCOM. So maybe a couple thoughts and, and maybe tie a couple things together. I'm not in that it's heartbroken, un, unfixable. Um, I'm not in that camp. Um, I think there are some structural issues. Certainly there's opportunities to go after. Um, but I think we have everything we need to go after that. Certainly you can optimize it a little bit to Will's point, or we can all howl at the wind and then be in the same place we are. So a piece of this is let's just get going and, and quit howling at the wind and then start leaning into it. I think of things, uh, some folks are here, Hondo 3D, maybe 4D, I think are kind of three things I'm really pressing on. Decentralize the machine, right? Let the folks make decisions at the lowest capable level. That's hard in a government bureaucracy, but if we're gonna succeed, you've gotta decentralize the execution and then hold people accountable. But I can't hold anybody accountable if I don't give them all the authority to go do that. Second is differentiate. And so for all the problems we have in the US military, it's still by far the best military in the world. Now you can argue, is it scalable, is it affordable? Will it be the best military 30 years from now, 10 years from now, three years from now? So how do we differentiate so that when I'm building an aircraft <coughs> that takes 40 million man hours, I'm gonna think about that differently than when I'm thinking about how do I rapidly put a combat system on there or how do I rapidly take advantage of an AI algorithm? If I wanna look at AI, I think its, it's immediate impact is gonna be I can much more rapidly train the force to General Scales point. It's about the human and I can simplify things for the operator. Get the machine doing what the machine's good for to allow the headspace to where our, our differentiating performance is our people. It's not our hardware. But you have to have a differentiating kind of view of the world. So it's not, um, we have one process that does everything right. That's, that's ridiculous. So how do we create a large number of tools and then empower us to pick the right tool for the job? So if you've you're got a startup out there, we have a way to work with startups. That's different than when we're building a $10 billion aircraft carrier. And they need to be different. You'll never do the same. If you're doing them the same way, you're not going to succeed. So, right, so how do we decentralize? How do we differentiate? And then how do we digitize? So completely rethink the way we build hardware, digital from the front. So our submarines and carriers now are digital from the start. That enables you to do a whole bunch of different things in training, in production, uh, and whatnot. And then it allows you to rapidly do some different things. We put common combat systems across different ships so you, know, you can put algorithms across. So how do you, if you think of those three Ds kind of folks, and then the last is uh, develop, and that's really how do we get world-class talent in the enterprise, whether it's in uniform, whether it's in civilian, whether it's you guys out there uh, in academics, how do we attract and really um, press forward world-class talent that can compete and win? And in, to me, that is where it's not the process that killed us, it's we bleed, we bled out talent over the last 10 to 15 to 20 years. Uh, and how do we recapture that talent? How do we incentivize that talent? Then you can do all the great things Will mentioned. You know, you can come up with great new schemes. And, and so to me, at the end of the day, it's all about pivot speed. Because I don't think we will ever predict the future very well. We don't want to be really wrong, but we'll never predict it right. So then it's our pivot speed, our agility, um, which then gives you two things, right? It gives you resilience and it gives you adaptability. And the great strength of America has been our pivot speed. Sometimes we're a little late to start pivoting, right? We put ourselves in a corner, but our pivot speed. So how do we attract the right folks? How do we educate them? How do we plan for the unplanned? I think that is how you can achieve um, organizational agility and be good at big things like construction projects, mega projects, and be good at really little things uh, that aren't those same large, complex issues. We've got to be good at many different things. 
Um, Don, so you work for the CIA, and um, <laughs> there's words like clandestine and covert and all that sort of stuff. So tell me and us, through the lens of the agency, how you deal with this sort of stuff internally, and then how you're reaching across, because uh, uh, John mentioned about um, it's hard to do business with us. I think there's a microcosm in there that says, maybe it's hard to do business amongst all of these organizations uh, sometimes. And so can, maybe you can help sure. us understand. So I, I, they let me out, what can I say? I do a lot of public speaking <laughs> actually. So, I, cause I can talk about technology and how it applies to mission all day long, uh, but I can talk about what we're doing and we're, we're, we're going through the same kinds of, of um, metamorphosis. You know, we're trying to teach people, first preference is to buy or barter right? Because it turns out that when you've got latest um, live video from uh, war zones, that maybe there are gaming companies that will trade you the rest of the world for the war zone. And, and that's a really different way of thinking about it, right? Um, and then the last thing you do is build. And then that's the thing that we're only, we're going to be the only ones who ever do stuff like that. But that's a real cultural change for, the, for all of us, really, which is, you know, an 80% solution on this timeline might actually be exactly what you need as opposed to the 100% that's three years too late to the fight. Sure. Right? So that's a, we're fighting, we're going through the same kinds of cultural changes. I will also say that in response to uh, General Jensen's comments, um, we have to decide as a nation whether we're gonna be defensive about IP or we're gonna count on the fact that we can out-innovate mm -hmm. everybody else at speed and then we should be nurturing, right? We should be placing the bets right, which is a little bit about what Inky tells, but I don't want to derail to that, and, and be figuring out how to nurture IP and do it with all the levers, not just, you know, each of us represented here. Um, and so some of the things that we're doing that I see in order for our folks to get it is we don't, every time somebody in my organization says private industry, I, I die a little inside. And the reason I say that is because most of them have never had any experience with private industry except that they write a contract for a very specific widget that's going to be delivered time certain, et cetera, et cetera, right? So part of what we're doing is we're actually, we put together a training course. It's, I'll call it, it's a, like a little mini MBA because we have to do it in a much more compressed timeline that actually teaches them the difference between venture capital, private equity, the way you evaluate a Lockheed Martin versus a Google versus a GE. Right, all of those things. We're talking to our partners about if you invent IP and you're waiting for us to take it from the lab bench to operation, you're probably gonna be waiting a long time. So how about with all that cash you're sitting on that you either self-capitalize or go raise around and actually turn it into a product? We love it. And then we can just be the ones who are doing the differentiated piece, right? Which is kind of free radical for most of our folks, right? <laughs> and then the other thing is we're doing externships and we're putting people into organizations that are not classical and not for spooky reasons. Don't walk out of here with that, right? CIAs and fil infiltrating <laughs> companies. No, because we get, <laughs> please, um, we get folks that are 10 years into their career that want to be using Google Tensor against really interesting problems, which we can, they can do inside and that's a big piece of our cloud strategy, but also that they can go do someplace else, and we put them into the actual business dev engineering elements, not the ones that are trying to sell the next thing back to the government, right? And I'd love to get to the point where we have 25% of our workforce, Hondo and I have talked about this, out in externships at any one time so that they understand, because at the end of the day, we've got to have teams, and that means we have to understand each other and figure out how to maximize for both sides of the team, right? And if you look at the curves on where R&D investments are coming from, mm -hmm. it's not the people typically supplying us. So we've got to forge those partnerships now with the mature as well as the startups, right? And I will say that um, the fact that you picked on Will and Hondo, or we have great <laughs> relationships with them uh, professionally, but also organizationally. And one of the things I like about us is we have very short interior lines, so we can do stuff at speed, and we also have special authority, so we don't get caught in the, in the FAR process unless we want to be. Um, so we, we actually team, I think, very effectively for doing early, early pilots of things that we then, um, these guys help us with scale and production and all those sorts of stuff. Let, let right? me just, Hunter wants to jump in, let me just ask, I, everything you just said is rock star. Give me an example of a need that you have today that you can communicate, and to whom would you communicate it to get the best solution right now? What, specifically, what could you use today? Um, oh, that isn't 
currently available or that's in production. Sure, or I, I, so to... you know, um, the ability to store a bunch of data on uh, a, a, a piece of skin the size of my 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 finger um, would be a really great capability. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look at I was my public affairs okay. and see if I just lost my job. But <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> For storage purposes, of course. I think this, this how do we draw the communities together is really important. I mean, one of the things we did at SOCOM was reverse internships. So we talk a lot about, and the government's famous, okay, we'll put government guys out in industry. What's, how's the reverse? How do we take advantage of up startup companies or even established companies, put them with our operators, to understand the problem sets uh, and understand how we think, um, and then how do you get that kind of nexus together? Which an interesting thing, I, I dumpster dove all the R&D files from the OSS. So young people out there, right? OSS, <laughs> predecessor to Dawn and, and SOCOM's uh, thing, World War II. Fabulous idea generation in a very short amount of time. And I couldn't figure out how they generated such good ideas so quickly and so deeply. And everybody says, well, it's World War. And I'm like, well, I don't think you think harder when it's World War, right? I think you go to what you're used to. The real thing was they, the, that environment forced the diversity of people looking at problems and brought in people to look at problems that all of us have here on the stage who have never dealt with them and had, were not, uh, didn't drag around 30 years of baggage about them. And so I think a lot of opportunity space for us, back to your how do we engineer the the entire kind of business proposition is getting folks together quickly, effectively, uh, who aren't normally used to working together, and that's where you're gonna see some of those giant leaps. So I'm gonna ask Kim a question, but General Mercier, I'm coming to you because you have the unfortunate position. I'm gonna ask you how this all applies to NATO. You're gonna <laughs> have to explain it all for us. Kim, you, you're the Chief Data Officer of the Air Force, and so to do everything that everybody has spoken about, it requires data. It requires being able to clean, normalize, standardize data, being able to analyze it in such a way that it provides decision-grade information for folks um, so that you can do many of the things that we're talking about. What sort of innovations is the Air Force exploring right now in order to to get you to meet mission as the chief data officer and to support all airmen across the Air Force? Well, you know, one of the biggest problems that we have uh, today uh, with regards to data um, is fundamentally our ability to access data. Um, you know, we have a lot of data in a lot of different places, uh, maybe on the tip of somebody's uh, <laughs> index finger someday, but, uh, but how do you access it? Um, how do you, you know, easily, uh, with the right authorities, uh, access the data that you need? How do you discover the data that exists? How do you access the data that you need? And then once you can access it, how do you, and when I say you, I don't just mean the human, I mean the human or the machine, uh, very rapidly uh, understand what that data is and, and what we can do with it. Um, because, I mean, I certainly agree with the point that was made that what we really need to do is leverage our uh, physical world and our physical sciences and our physical capabilities, which in many ways are data enabled, uh, to advance our cognitive capabilities. Uh, that's the world that we need to go in. Uh, we need to up the ante of uh, our soldiers, sailors, uh, and Marines so that they can do the, the jobs at a much higher level of performance, a much higher level of capability uh, than they can today. And that's how we're going to deal with um, those future threats and that um, sort of revisionist powers that are evolving. But we've got to do that with data. and We've got to be able to leverage the data in such a way that we can advance our cognitive uh, capabilities at speed and at scale. Um, so discovery, access, uh, and a very quick and easy way to understand what that data is and how do I put it to use uh, is really where we're at and is really what we're looking for, more advanced technologies to help us with. I'll come to you one sec, Bob, one sec. General Mercier, you've just heard what everybody said. This is basically two organizations, actually three, because Elsa's would represent civilian uh, uh, work. Um, three organizations talking about, we seemingly sound aligned in idea we seemingly sound aligned in the way we think culture should be changed to make this happen. You have 29 member nations to worry yes. about. Um, so, so from the SACT perspective, 
how does all this land on you? And quite frankly, what do you do with all of this when you have to herd 29 member nations? Because America's relationship with NATO, given um, uh, your great power competitor to the east of you, uh, is it's an important relationship. So what, how are you thinking about this? Yeah, thank you very much for this question. And yes, we are 29 nations, and the role in NATO is uh, uh, when we uh, want to have an agreement on something, we need to be sure that the 29 nations agree with that. If it's 28, it's not agreed on. And uh, so the problem and challenges we have talked about is time 29 for us. But, but um, so what does that mean? That means that uh, we, uh, we need to uh, first try to, when we talk about innovation, try to uh, be sure that uh, our 29 nations, they have exactly the same level of understanding of the problems and even of the, of the, uh, uh, of the taxonomy, of the, uh, of, of the definitions. And uh, we are working a lot on that because I'm not sure that in 29 nations, when I talk about big data, artificial intelligence, cognitive computing, I'm not sure that they, are, they, are, they have all the same understanding. And especially because the permanent representative uh, sorry if there are diplomats in the, in the area, but the permanent <laughs> representative of NATO who are making the decision for their nations, they are all ambassadors, and, uh, and, and, and many of them have, do not have uh, the uh, technological awareness uh, that allow to make quick decisions with that. And that, uh, so our, our first, first priority is really to uh, make sure that we have the same level of understanding and we raise the technical awareness of our uh, stakeholders. In fact, we are doing that, and this is the role of my command. The value of NATO, and this is the same for, I've seen that for the most successful company, for instance, in the Silicon Valley, these are those companies who are op uh, able to operate and adapt at the same time. Mm -hmm. Those who have a huge day-to-day -day business, they spend a huge amount of resources on the preparation of the future. And, and, and NATO has two strategic commands, one is allied command operation, uh, looking at uh, dealing with day-to-day -day operations, the current operations. At, at the end, there is an American general based in Europe, and allied command transformation, my command, based here in Norfolk, Virginia, where we look at the future. And this is a value to have it. So we can work together, and we can continue to operate and prepare for, and prepare for the future. Another thing is, uh, looking at our 29 nations, we have a very disproportionate rate of uh, techn technological development. And, uh, and, uh, and that's, that's a difficulty, especially if we want to ensure something which is absolutely essential, and we have not talked ab uh, about it uh, yet, as uh, this is interoperability. And interoperability on the technical part of it, we will always make it happen. The technology is here. But what I, when I'm talking interoperability, I'm talking about, about political interoperability. Looking at uh, autonomous systems, Artificial use of, of artificial intelligence, use of data, and uh, are we sure that our 29 nations they have the same level of acceptance of uh, of uh, of the systems? And the answer is no. Or the answer is yes if we combine their, uh, their uh, if we if we raise this awareness and put them together and try to work together from the beginning. Because if we develop, if we have 29 different innovation initiatives, and this is pretty much what we have today. And, uh, and then if we let this initiative go uh, on their own, and then we try to combine our effort, we kill the interoperability. Especially, especially today, where most of our systems, they rely more and more on, on digital uh, architectures. Uh, and uh, and uh, we, we spent a huge effort to develop this uh, a standard of interoperability for these digital architectures. And uh, the good thing is we are doing that together with the US. And, uh, and uh, the uh, standard of interoperability that is developed by the US side to deal with partners is exactly the same than the one we are developing in NATO. And, and, and this is purposely. So we are sure that uh, any partner nation, uh, even in Asia, uh, that, uh, that could be interoperable with US, they are interoperable with NATO and vice versa. But it's a huge effort and it's a permanent effort uh, to do it. So many challenges to put all together at the same uh, uh, same pace of innovation. And in addition to that, uh, we talked about the human capital, and we need to be sure that, that uh, we, uh, um, we, uh, we define the, the skills that the nations need to develop in their own countries to be able to uh, uh, fight together. Because uh, the uh, main difference between me and, and these services here is we are not recruiting people. We are, uh, we are uh, taking the people that are providing by the nations 
Most of them, they stay here for three or four years. And we need to be sure that those people, we define the skills and we control the skills and we, we send that to the nations in order, in order for the nation to prepare them correctly. Otherwise, I will receive people, I will have the right numbers, but they will be useless. Uh, and, and, and this issue, it, it's a wonderful challenge, speaking frankly. And this is why we have even, together with MD5, uh, organized an innovation week in September in which uh, we work together in order to teach innovation to our people. What does that mean? How we can develop design thinking? And uh, because, because, again, all the, I have 35 uh, nationalities in my headquarters because I have partner nations as well. I mean, uh, the, uh, the, uh, this is a great chance, but this is a great difficulty if, we want, if I want to combine the strengths of uh, all, all these members. And, and, and just to not speak too long, but we can deal with that because uh, we could say it's an impossible challenge, but in fact, it's not impossible. And if we can bring together all this, uh, these nations uh, with a good understanding of the niche competencies that we can, we can find in some of our nations. For instance, one of the best nations regarding cyber in the alliance is Estonia. It's not the biggest nation, but this is, but, but this is one of the greatest nations regarding cyber development. If we can combine the niche competencies of these 29 nations, there is no one nation that can compete against this alliance. And this is, this is, why, this is why this is a huge opportunity but, but behind that, there is, there, is, there is a lot of work in order to combine our strengths. Thank you, sir. So l let's talk about AI, because it's all the rage. Everybody talks about it. Um, Elsa, um, we, had a, we had a brief, I think, Twitter exchange. Um, <laughs> the last episode of Vice News talked about how China um, is using, it was about the facial recognition piece. And so my question is, based on your research and your work, how far behind are we, if we're behind? And two, do the democratic principles of the United States preclude us from doing what the Chinese government can do faster to train their AI efforts faster than we can? Uh, thank you. Uh, great questions there. I guess I'll start out by saying that I think a lot of what we've seen from China in terms of AI strategy and uh, intensification of efforts has been actually in response to what arguably was a Sputnik moment for Chinese leaders, which was AlphaGo's defeat of Lisa Dole in the spring of 2016, which was uh, up to, by some accounts 10 years earlier than AI experts had estimated and AI could solve a game that complex, and I think certainly got the attention of, le of the Chinese leadership, including leaders within the Chinese military, that demonstrated the, the advancement of uh, Western AI, and uh, DeepMind has since been acquired by Google, and certainly so I think that was a wake-up call in certain respects, and that combined with uh, some of the plans and policies that came out in late 2016 through the Office of Science and Technology Policy, I think was really the impetus for a lot of what we've seen since in terms of a high-level focus on artificial intelligence from Chinese leadership up to the level of Xi Jinping, who uh, supposedly has been reading about AI in his spare time, or at least had two books on AI prominently featured behind him in a bookshelf in one address he gave. So I think certainly <laughs> say that there is been a lot of, uh, uh, to speak of China's rise in AI has often, has almost become a cliche at this point, but I think certainly it is clear if you're looking at met metrics like uh, patents or publications that China is rapidly advancing and at least quantitatively has surpassed the US in certain respects, including in the domain of deep learning, but I think in terms of uh, cutting edge advances, some of the most advanced algorithms and really next generation research, the US still still is in the lead, so to speak, uh, to the extent that it makes sense to speak of this as a race. And certainly there is clear competition. I, I would certainly, I don't think it's an arms race, so to speak, given that AI is not a weapon, it's a technology where you have a broad range of techniques and applications and Certainly in terms of things like facial recognition, uh, the massive amounts of data that China has available and the Chinese government's willingness to make that available to private companies can be an advantage given that the more data you have, the often the better your algorithms and the results can be. So I think certainly there are, there are particular applications and techniques in which China's demonstrated some excellence and certainly I think a fairly whole of nation approach to AI is a, uh, could be an advantage going forward, though certainly the China's AI revolution has, for the most part, been led by fairly dynamic private companies so far. Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, and some of these companies may even have lobbied or encouraged the government to provide greater support and funding for their effort. And 
Beijing has since declared that these are to be national champions, leading national engineering laboratories and technologies like deep learning, brain-inspired intelligence. So I think certainly we're seeing an attempt on the part of the Chinese government to really harness the dynamism of a number of these companies and throw the support of the state behind it in terms of high levels of funding and a major focus on uh, the cultivation of talent, both through education and recruitment, that could, could accelerate these efforts going forward. And I think certainly... China could have some long-term systemic and structural advantages in that regard when you combine the fact that some of these companies and a growing number of startups that are at the forefront of global efforts in the space uh, with the massive amounts of funding being thrown at uh, this development and certainly beyond AI could, trend, could have an impact across all sectors of the Chinese economy and, and society just as the AI could be transformative in all, all of our economies, societies, and militaries and certainly the Chinese People's Liberation Army is also focused on this disruptive potential and with an approach of military civil fusion or civil military integration, trying to leverage a deeper synergy between commercial and defense developments. Uh, there could, be a, uh, could certainly be the potential for China to advance quite rapidly in a number of the applications they're pursuing, which include everything from swarm intelligence to AI-enabled decision support. Um. I'm going to have to go back and watch the footage on this because that was <laughs> that, is, that was impressive, and I got I got I, I got a lot of it. Um, so, but but interestingly enough, so Will in your old job and certainly transferable to the Air Force, and Kim certainly as the Chief Data Officer, AIs. So, from the Air Force perspective, and then from the Navy perspective, um, how are we thinking about being able? I, I mean, it's a really basic question: um, training and getting ahead. If we can't do everything that our great power competitors. Are there alternative ways to get to where we need to be is the question, right? So please. No, I, I don't think we can risk it. It's, it's, it's not clear exactly what the relationship between machine learning is going to be the first form of AI that's going to be broadly uh, able to be operationalized. And we just simply can't risk not having that capability in the hands of our operators mm -hmm. and, and fighting an opponent who does. Um, it seems to me that the first thing it's going to enable is brute force-like tasks to be done well. It will make mistakes. So I never thought in any AI program I did in my last job and anyone I'm doing now that it's ready to replace people. But I do think it's going to change the jobs that our people do. And it's going to be a lot more of supervising of systems that are finding things and then telling them if they're right or not. So almost moving into a coach role. So that's a different kind of, uh, different kind of job, it's a different kind of training, but you can't actually get people ready for it until they have it in their hands because, because it's a very personalized kind of technology. I'm sure everyone probably has on their phone a news app that they love and you've been training it for years, right? The kinds of things that you like and the things that you don't like. You could imagine a very strong analog of that with every operator, uh, training up AI over the course of their career, potentially handing it down and so the thing we don't want to do is be behind the power curve on this. The tough part about AI is that it, could, it can be applied to almost anything. Mm -hmm. And so it's tough to start on anything. We don't build systems for AI. In fact, generally, if, you were, if you're in my shoes, and you're, you're handed Air Force acquisition, we're very good on vertical things. You pull up our org chart, we keep breaking things up, and you'll see a bureaucracy that has lots of stovepipes, and there'll be aircraft and bombers and C2 systems. Uh, but there's not much that's horizontal, right? We, you know, the internet, I mean, it doesn't have a program manager, and it works. <laughs> <laughs> and we could never build that. Because there's some horizontal <laughs> things. <laughs> there's some horizontal things that we're committed to. And so to really harness AI and put it in the hands of our people, we're going to have to learn to do horizontal well. That's committing to standards, interfaces, practices that maybe are not optimal locally, but that are optimal globally. And until we do that, we may have some isolated pockets of AI. We may put it on some drones so that they can detect targets on their own, but it's not going to be the same kind of AI you could imagine that was done across the broad enterprise. And the reason I fear it so much is um, it's the one technology that I ever saw in my last job, and it's still the only one I see in this one, that potentially could level the playing field on human advantage. Now, our people will be the best, but I don't want to have them be the only things that are learning in conflict. And maybe we're best on day one, day two, day three, but if we're fighting people and machines that are both learning together, what if there's a crossover point 
where we simply just can't ask our people to crunch enough numbers, process enough data quickly enough to keep up. We, we owe it to them to not put them in that position. So we're gonna to have to figure out how to do AI across all of our systems, which means getting the horizontal and, ac and acquisition actually done. So Kim, I asked you, you wanna add something, any, anything yeah, from I mean, your uh, position uh, in Hondo? So a lot of good stuff there, certainly. And you know, I, I don't think that we, um, we develop uh, our systems from the perspective of the strategic use of data. Um, I mean, it's one thing to say, you know, we, we don't develop for AI, we don't even develop for data. Uh, and we don't think about what is the strategic value of the data uh, that is inherent to this capability. Um, and I think, you know, industry has taught us a few things that it would be useful to uh, pay attention to. You know, the Amazons and the Googles of the world, they collect a lot of data and they do it for a purpose. <laughs> you know, as they're collecting data, uh, they know that there is a very strategic use of this data. If I can know everything there is to know about this particular customer or this particular uh, individual who is doing this particular search, and then I can know everything there is to know about every one of those customers or every one of those searchers uh, in, at scale, uh, wow, now I have a very powerful strategic asset. Uh, and so that, and then if I know everything about the one thing and the multiples of the things, and then they can know about each other because I have AI uh, that is learning as it's uh, capturing data and is sharing its knowledge with the other you know, sort of nodes on the edge, and Tesla you know, is sort of teaching us that lesson. Uh, then I can have a very powerful set of capabilities unto themselves. So it's this whole strategic use of data and thinking about data as a strategic asset from the get-go. And then how do you effectively apply AI to that strategic uh, asset that you have available to you? It's kind of where Hondo, you, had, you wanted to add something. So, so I think, um, yeah, AI is important. Yeah, AI is a big thing. We should know everything about everybody. And every, but if we're not careful, it's a little to me like 3D printing was five years ago. It's this cool little thing and it's this big thing. Why could we need 3D print everything? And then you get lost in the, it's so big that we make it, we almost mystify it. And, and I think if you're watching what's happened, uh, I'll take the Marine Corps, so I support both Navy and Marine Corps. If you watch what the Marine Corps is done with additive manufacturing and actually put it at the point of use and demystified it, and it's just another way we get the job done. And instead of sending a $70,000 part back for a 10 cent piece of plastic on the part, we just print the part like we did a float on the USS Wasp a couple days ago. I kind of see the same thing with AI. So my, my only fear in this, we should know everything about everybody and all that kind of stuff. Great vision, and, and I'm with Will. It can be a great equalizer. But we don't want to wait for that. So how I think the, I think the trick for us is how do we enable that at the point of use, at the point of need? Not this big monster back in some center somewhere and you know, consult yeah. that. How, how is AI just a piece of everything we do, not a new thing we're doing? Because in my heart of hearts, right, the win is gonna be our great strength of the human enabled by great decision aids. And if we can get those matched up right where the human's doing what the human does well with great decision aids, yeah, even today, I think you'd argue in the AI algorithms, a, a mediocre player with an AI algorithm will beat an autonomous algorithm almost any time. But we've got to get this away that it's useful to that person wherever they are. And it's not this big grand thing. And so, that, and so then how do we leverage the crowd? How do we create platforms right, that enable anybody in our enterprise to access the data, back to Kim's point, data access, uh, have tools at the use, and then they can figure out how to use it in their particular case so we can accelerate everybody, not just accelerate kind of at the, at the macro level. I think that's the trick, and, and that gets back into, which I didn't really appreciate early on, how do we get that into institutional learning? Right. Why, why at basic, I gotta teach you how to shoot, I gotta teach you how to run, I gotta teach you how to do pull-ups, 
I probably ought to teach you how to use a 3D printer, and I need to teach you how to use TensorFlow so you can write an AI algorithm to make your job better. So until we, again, get back to the human element and create these as tools as part of the, the force we have, not this, we train a military and then somebody else does an AI algorithm to give them something. That, that, I think that's where we really, done, again, get innovation and get adaptability at scale not in little niche areas. Right, and, and so you make a really good point, Hondra, and I want to bring Morgan in, because we're talking about, and, and, and John as well, we're talking about institutionalizing mm -hmm. all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, John's responsibility um, at NDU is enormous. Every PME program we have mm -hmm. uh, across uh, the military, every uh, educational program inside the agency, everything should be inundated at the lowest level upwards. So Morg, MD5 is the mm -hmm. DOD proponent for our hacking for defense class. Um, right. uh, we are trying desperately and succeeding at harnessing the true talent of America's graduate student population. We teach, uh, uh, it's an open university forum, so we get people from everywhere to work on these hard problems. And it's because of the organization that you're running. Let's talk a little bit about just hacking for defense, if you will, and then let's talk about the other projects that you're doing to help institutionalize, because General Mercer just said MD5 is helping NATO. That's right. um, we have lots of help. We're, you're helping lots of people across the forces, <laughs> uh, across the force. So tell us a little bit more about that. Sure. So, I mean, lots of stuff that we could say about hacking for defense, but perhaps by way of um, opening chapeau, it may be easier to just talk about the sort of theory of the case. Hacking for defense supports a broader sort of philosophical, I think, underpinning to who and what MD5 is as an organization. Um, and our theory of the case goes something like this, and it's something that's been referenced by a lot of the folks on the stage, which is that, you know, really, if you think about who and what the Department of Defense is, which is, um, you know, 1.3 million men and women under arms, and another 800,000 civilian employees, and, and even when you add in all of the folks from the industrial base who are working hard on tough problems that the that the department and the national security community is struggling with, you're talking about still touching maybe one to 3% of a 320 million uh, populated nation, right? And so from that perspective, I think MD5 comes to the table and says, look, if you believe that, if you believe in the democratization of technology and you believe in, in, in the fact that um, things like geographical boundaries and resources mean less and less, then really wars of the future are going to be predicated on things like institutional agility and things like our ability to adapt and ideas mm -hmm. and, the, and being able to move faster and better than our opponents and our competitors. Um, and so for us, innovation becomes a question of, no, like if, if, if talent and ideas and technology are equally distributed across race and gender and geography, then the department has to get up from the beltway and go find those things and try and pull them in at the same time that we try and expose the problems that we're facing to those communities. And that's really what MD5 is all about. And Hacking for Defense, I think, and in, in our partners at BMNT who help us deliver it, are exactly, it, that is, that it, it encapsulates in a beautiful way exactly what the MD5 mission is. This notion of taking difficult DOD problems, putting them in the hands of students who would, for a lot of very good reasons, frankly, institutional, uh, budgetary, regulatory, whatever, never, never normally interact with the department and help us solve problems. And that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, it, it really is. For, for those of you in the audience who don't, uh, aren't fully aware of the Hacking for Defense program, um, it's, it's uh, a, a, well, I should first point out that our students in the class today are sitting in the front row over here. Stand up just for a quick second. Um, uh, they, they are doing a lot of work um, for the Marine Corps and for the Air Force right now. For the Marine Corps, the, the Marine Corps Warfighting Lab, they're working on a social media problem about how to use social media at the lowest level, uh, particularly in urban environments, to keep Marines safe. And then for the Air Force, the problem is um, how to keep a downed uh, or crashed pilot hydrated for 28 days without resupply. Anybody who's gone through that experience, 28 days is a long time. And, and so thank you. Thanks. Uh, th this is, this, these two problems right here, they've been working on all semester. Um, they apply lean principles, uh, lean startup principles to a problem, and we source these problems from everybody on this stage, right? These folks help us get problems that we can get really smart grad students to work on. Um, and I, is Pete, where's Pete? Is, can I see, is Pete Noel? Where, where is he sitting? There he is, back there. 
So Pete Newell, um, 30 years in the Army, his last job was the Rapid Equipping Force for the US Army, um, co-founded BMNT, and actually co-founded the whole Hacking Forward Defense movement. Um, he is, was kind enough to let me uh, participate in all of this, but the, the, the type of work that, that they're doing, both in the classroom and then for the various institutions across, um, not just the DOD, but other government uh, uh, entities, is important because it's including all of you, right? I, I, the point you made that we're touching one to 3%, if that, of, of, of the available talent in America is the craziest fact I've heard all night. It's true and it, it's horrible. Um, uh, I also want to... Can I say something about that just real quick? Yes, please. You. So, and only because I think it's worth perhaps foot stomping and this is an old trope of mine, so you'll have to forgive me. But I mean, here's what I'd like to say, right? In, this notion of what, of what you just said, right, this notion of needing to be in contact with a larger portion of the population, that's not just a nice to have, right? When you put it in the context of near peer competition and global powers, it's an existential national security issue. It's not just convenient, it does, it's not just nice that we're doing business with Georgetown and touching <laughs> students and getting them to participate, right? I mean, the problems that you've described that you all are working on, I mean, these are real problems. They're not throwaways. We've got really smart people from all of these offices working on these things, and you're helping us solve them, and so, that's not insignificant. So, so where we've got to structurally address it, though, is, is we're doing a great job of coming up with ideas, got, got a long way to go. Yep. You know, back to the core point, though, then, then how do we get our transition speed where it needs to go? And so to some degree, we've got to, we've got, we are, we're growing this talent of great things we should be doing, and then have no way to actually do them in a cost-effective, operationally responsive at the speed of war mechanism, nor how to translate that into scale. And so I think the other challenge for a lot of us in the, in the other PC architecture is great idea generation. When you invent that, how do I get it on the battlefield tomorrow? That's right. That's right. And if we don't have the machine synchronized right, We'll just, you know, it's, it's a bunch of gears interacting. We'll just chew up all the gears because right. the only thing worse than not having something is seeing it and not being able to get it. That's right. And that so, I think, right. so the, I think the other area of opportunity is reinvent, uh, as, as we said here, reinvent the business model that rewards transition speed and enables transition and pivot speed so that as ideas are generated or as the threat changes or as our national interests uh, change over time, we can then quickly pivot organizationally and not just, okay, well, let's work on that and then we find the ideas that we can. Part of our real frustration right now is getting new ideas. Even more frustration is seeing the idea and not pivot on it. And that's where I think there's great opportunity space. And I think not just the changing the business model from that perspective, right. but for example, I did an architecture talk at a, a company that I won't name. It's a com large commercial company. And I suggested to them that as they negotiate their server right. architectures for GDPR, that they could put in their terms and conditions or in their negotiating po points with those nation states that you can't use this to target people groups, for example. Now, I don't know how that'll hold up in a court of law, but if there's not even a thin veneer of that, so helping people think about that, because again, we, we tend to make this a technology conversation. This is an economic viability conversation, and those folks are no more interested in having their technology used inappropriately, I mean, we have current examples of that, than we are, right? And we don't think about them in that kind of partnering that they can actually be maybe a first tier of defense from a national security economic viability perspective. And that only comes through conversations, mm -hmm. right? So I love that there's an audience full of technologists. I hope there's a bunch of people that are very interested in business here that are gonna say, you know what, I can make a difference wherever I go if I'm thoughtful about how it is that I play into the economic viability and the national security of the nation. Mm -hmm. And those conversations are way overdue in my opinion. Amen, if I, Amen. If I, John. If I could along those lines, so um, resourcing national security, so economic viability. So uh, we're really not gonna get synchronized as a nation um, unless we consider the strategic imperative of what this nation looks like for our grandkids, right? So we're in a very consumptive uh, near-term, even this, the innovation conversation we're having right now is very much now over the next two or three years, right? So we need to kind of imagine what our grandkids' lives look like from an economic viability perspective and a great, great power competition of what 150% debt to GDP looks like. So what does that look like for our grandkids? 
So imagine that. And then with the great power competition, not only does that put us behind, but everything that we're talking about in terms of this innovative space comes down to who is gonna have the strategic overmatch that sets the context for the global rules and norms. So for our grandkids, what does it look like if for the first time since perhaps King George, they're working under somebody else's rule set? I mean, that's really what we're talking about right now. So the so what of this, all of this is all very interesting about AI and, and different neat things that are out there and how can we apply them and processes and think about how very much this has been an inward facing conversation tonight. But if you spend a lot of time like I have out in the Western Pacific, I've done four uh, deployments over there, UDP, I've been stationed over there twice and I've done two carrier deployments uh, through there. And if you look at what's going on right now and how we compete with China, uh, from a military perspective now, out there in that region, it's not good. And, and if you look at it 10 years, 15 years from now, and where we stand, it's not just AI, it's not just deep learning, it's not just quantum computing, it's how all of that stuff interacts and how we imagine that. And how, when I say how we imagine that, in the way the Department of Defense works, that means how the services imagine that. The services set the requirements. Look at Eric Schmidt's testimony just a couple days ago, Google that and just look at even the page one through two. So we talk a lot about acquisitions and how acquisitions is broken. What we're talking about, so that's in the industrial base sense, how we produce stuff where decisions were made 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and the industrial base and how it's been a, you know, a, a war on price and a race to the bottom on costs that's driven out the whole middle layer of the industrial base. That's, what, those, that's producing the stuff, the industrial base, that we made decisions on 10 or 15 years ago. The conversation here is what it looks like 10 or 15 years from now. So my point is when I say that, hey, we're, we're broken until we can figure out what the force of the future looks like, we means the services. The services own the budget. So $700 billion, there's some defense-wide uh, in there, you know, DepSec, DEF's got a little bit, but the services own the budget. And right now the services are focused on current readiness. And they're focused on trying to, and, and hey, all the budgets look good and, and money is here right now. There's, there's a cliff coming in two years, right? So there's, there's nobody in industry who's betting on over this, these budgets, these next two years, that, that the good times are here again, right? And so I'll ask you, who in here is from industry? Okay, so maybe about uh, 15%. So I'll tell you, what we're trying to produce at the Eisenhower School are graduates, not who think like business people, because we're not. We're national security experts, but we need to understand how business people think. And, and if we don't get to, the, to bringing that back together, we are not gonna harness all of this incredible innovation that's going on in the United States right now. It's not gonna happen. Because you know, even for small businesses right now, they shy away from working with the federal government. It's too painful. You know, you're criminalized walking in the door. You know, you're a criminal, you're gonna to make too much money, it's the Nye Commission all over again. You know, it's the war merchants and you're gonna make a bunch of money, but we got the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations and we're gonna decriminalize you with all these rules and regulations. We're gonna tell you exactly how much profit you're gonna make and that doesn't work. And that's what they learned in 1938 to 1940. And it really took, it really took the blitzkrieg. There was nothing about shredding Poland. There was nothing about the, uh, the Anschluss. There was nothing about uh, you know, the, the bargain for Czechoslovakia that compelled anybody until the, the Germans went raging through uh, the, the low country and into France. So that's where we're at right now. We have to realize the strategic imperative of the game that's on that, that is going to define our grandkids' lives. There's political decisions that have to be made economically. You know, Admiral Mullen was the first that observed, you know, somebody asked him what keeps me up at night, and he said it's the national debt. So that's something as Americans that, you know, somebody's gonna, we're, we're gonna have to have that conversation because this decision, all this innovation is great, but the decision space discretionary out of the pie keeps going like that. And we're not, and these are all just great ideas that we're not gonna be able, so it's the requirement side that the services need to start imagining out to the future. We all have to start imagining how all this stuff is going to be able, is going to integrate with each other or interact in ways it's not just AI, it's not just automation, it's not just deep learning. Uh, and we're gonna have to understand that there's somebody that's got a better plan than we do right now. Last thing I'll leave you with is, you know, China. So, uh, China, South China Sea, existential threat uh, for them. I get it. They see that as an existential issue for them. 
One Belt Road and Road. Okay, that's kind of historical. That's great. Africa, taking commodities. Well, I mean, it's a big country. They need commodities. Electrical grid in South America. Why are they buying electrical grid in South America? I got to tell you, if it's a great power competition and we're competing with competitors, them and Russia, who are centrally planned, very agile, they make decisions about the flows of capital, then that's a problem for this country that we're going to have to organize ourselves and come up with, with something that looks like a plan, a national strategy to secure the innovation base and to make viable the industrial base. Uh, or this great power competition, it's a competition, which means somebody wins, somebody loses. And uh, I think the inspiration for all of us needs to be 10, 15 years down the road in our grandkids. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. <laughs> um, I, I, two things. One is, when I introduced everybody, I forgot to introduce my co-conspirator right here in the front row. Lieutenant Colonel Matt uh, Zace is my co-instructor for Hacking for Defense for the last two years at Georgetown. He also happens to be the director for Iraq uh, on the National Security Council staff. Um, so we don't attract really good talent for the <laughs> class, but... <laughs> we got Matt. I'm teasing Matt. It's it's people like this who come to do all the things that we're talking about. So Matt, brother, thank you for being here. You raced down here from the White House to be here this evening. Bob, let me ask you. You've heard all of this. I want to go right back to soldier lethality. John is took us to 100,000 feet. Um, in the middle here, we talked about specific things that are going to we think are going to make us better. That are going to drive distance and speed away from our great power competitors. How does it go, drive back yeah. to soldier lethality? That's a great question. First of all, let me say that I can just feel the joy up here. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, at last we're beginning, we're beginning to face off against two enemies who are worthy of our weapons. Um, the whole China and Russia thing, it's the town just, this town just scintillates with the joy of returning to what someone used the phrase, great power wars. It's August 1914 all over again, and we're in love with it. Um, but just stop for a minute. Matt, will re <laughs> Matt lives it every day. For the last 70 years, we've been beaten by, uh, by mediocre powers, one of which has the gross national product of Estonia. Um, and we've been humiliated on the battlefield Time after time after time after time. Um, you know, there's a great quote. A French journalist once asked Ho Chi Minh how in the world his little country of 19 million could ever face off against the world's greatest superpower. And he answered prophetically, uh, they'll kill a hundred of us, we'll kill one of them, and they will tire of it first. Same rule could be applied to Niger back in October or... Uh, Syria over the last two or three weeks. No, I think, I think big countries with big toys and big budgets and big industry is a wonderful thing. But war, to quote my best friend, Mr. C, uh, war is a two-sided contest in which both sides fully intend to win. And the idea that even China and Russia will try to match us plane for plane, ship for ship, uh, tank for tank is ridiculous. None of those countries could stand uh, in front of us for a moment uh, with big industry, big data. So what I'm suggesting to you to answer Chris's point, uh, Kim talked about strategic data. Well, what about tactical data? There's this great phrase, it's called networking to the edges. Well, I would submit to you that if you're in Syria today, you're not on the edge. As far as national security strategy is concerned and the survival of, of our national uh, security infrastructure, the guy that's at the center of the network isn't on the edge, is, is the uh, soldier or Marine whose death changes fundamentally the shape and scope of our national security strategy. Why are we relooking our strategy in Central Africa? Four dead Special Forces soldiers. That's why we're doing it. And how were they equipped? Did they have a UAV? No. Did they have radios? Not really. Uh, they had a GoPro, which the enemy then stole and put on the Internet when we watched our soldiers die. So let me just, I, I, I don't want to talk too much. This, this isn't my, my thing here. But here's the thing. Remember, 
the end of the day, war is not a clash of machines. War is inherently a human enterprise. And victory or defeat is not determined by the amount of machinery or data that you throw at the enemy, but uh, by changing the enemy's attitude. Enemies don't lose until they feel that they've been beaten. And I know of no enemy that we face at any level of competition who is terribly impressed with the dominance of our technology. I think they're more aware <coughs> of the weakness of our human capital and our inability to face mediocre enemies who have the will to win and a willingness to die. I believe that our great, I believe that our great, okay, two credit hours at the Army War College. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, we have a thing called center of gravity. We have, and, and then a subset of that is vulnerable center of gravity. Uh, you listen to this group and you'd say, well, our vulnerable center of gravity is our inability to maintain the technology base, our inability to share data at the strategic level, the inability of us to build dominant weapons of war that are affordable. No. Our vulnerable center of gravity is dead Americans. So I just have to end my talk with this question to you. If dead Americans are our most vulnerable center of gravity, and as we've seen in recent history, those most likely to die are those that are networked at the edges, then why doesn't our country do more to keep alive those most likely to die? If not for the humanitarian sake of the widows and orphans that, uh, that survived these young, dead young Americans, but from a pure, cold-hearted focus on what's best for to protect our vulnerable center of gravity and allow the National Command Authority to prosper in this uncertain world. Remember, the bottom line is very simple. <coughs> Enemy has a vote. And a young Syrian or ISIS or Taliban fighter standing up in some godforsaken mountain top doesn't give a crap about our love affair with big data. He just wants to kill us. And we ought to do everything we can to help him stay alive. So strategic data, how about tactical data? One of the things I find so, in, I just left this morning our, 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 our prep session for the Chief of Staff of the Army tomorrow on this subject. And, and we got in the subject of data sharing and metadata and the importance of shaping social networking so that young soldiers can understand the command or the, the, the enemy's uh, conflict environment before he goes into a theater of war. And yet, here we are in 2018. Rag pickers in Mongolia have cell phones. And there's not a single soldier or Marine that has access to the internet and cell phones when he's at the edge of the network. So it's very important for the National Command Authority to be able to scoop up all the wonderful data. Remember, the thing that's most likely to kill soldiers is uncertainty. Uncertainty is driven by friction. And friction comes from ignorance of a soldier's surroundings, a situational awareness. We're no better today than we were when I was a second lieutenant. I think worse. Let me leave you with one set of data. And during the ETO and the advance from Normandy into the heart of Germany, the mission time for direct support artillery across the board was four and a half minutes. Four and a half minutes. That's from the identification of the target to the delivery of fire on the target. You factor a 30-second 30 30 uh, time of flight. That's a four-minute decision cycle uh, in World War II. Today, it's 55 minutes. Now, the speed of light hasn't changed last time I checked. So there's something going on here that goes beyond data. And, it's, and we have a long way to go to make data fit what we really do today which is fight small wars, face off against great power competitors, mainly through the confrontation with so, surrogates. So, Bob. Again, not that I feel strongly about any of this. Uh, but but your, <laughs> your response to this conversation is interesting because it's, generally speaking, we're biased by our geography today, where we are here in the United States. General Mercier, your, your, yep. your geography is a little bit closer to people who are of concern to you is what Bob says more important to you than what any other people on the panel are, are talking about tonight? Is it more important in NATO? No, every, everything is important, but I would like to react on that and uh, just to follow on what you have said. Uh, first, uh, I, I'm, I'm always uh, keen to say that uh, data is a strategic resource, but 
all strategic resources can be used at the tactical level, and, uh, and, and we have done that already. But uh, what, 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 your, uh, um, uh, what came to my mind when I listened to you is, uh, what is important is not technology first. And those, those terrorist groups, uh, when they are much better than us, they are not much better than us, not, not because of technology, no technology. This is, this is because they are very much decentralized, as you said. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I saw that, uh, let's say, in Mali, when you have a group of people, they, they have never met for most of them. They, uh, they meet in one place, and one guy takes over uh, the control of all these, uh, all, all these people. They make their action, and then uh, they disband, and some of them will never see, uh, see, see each other again. What does that mean? In operational terms, in our terms, military terms, we call that decentralized operational control. And they, they do that very well. And us, we oppose to that very centralized operational control. And because we oppose very centralized operational control, we are less flexible. And that comes for, can we decentralize the operational control correctly and have this decentralized mode? Yes, but this is, this is a totally different operational organizations, uh, organization. And to do that, we need technology. But it's not technology first. To do that, we need technology, we need to build cloud-like architectures, and we need to think differently our command and control, empower our people on the, uh, on the lowest echelon, and see what kind of data they need in order to be empowered, and then based on that, we can be very flexible. It's, it's, it requires a huge change in most of the operational concept. Or we do that in specific areas, such as spe special forces, but, but for the normal services, I, I think, I see that for my country and many of the countries, it's a huge change. But if we, don't, if we do not change like this, why do we, do, do we, uh, do we uh, um, go with this, uh, with this uh, artificial intelligence and big data and, uh, and, and new approaches? It is to decentralize what we do. Yeah. Otherwise, we just digitalize normal processes that will not be helpful. And sometimes it's probably, uh, it's probably worse. So I'm gonna, I want to go down the line, because I want to bring the audience in for some questions. I want to go down the line. If you were in charge for a day, which many of you are, um, <laughs> <laughs> actually more than one day, where right now, what would you prioritize as the number one area where we should put US investment in innovation? Like, like where should we be putting our money right now? More. Uh, Non-traditional non broadening assignments and professional development. So Non-traditional broadening assignments and Yeah, so, so here's what I mean, right? Some of, the, some of the other panelists have referenced this. So whether you call it externships or whether you call it, um, you know, tours with industry or whether or not you call it, um, you know, expanding the horizon of human-centered design and these kinds of things. I mean, I do think that there's, there's a fundamental human element that some of the panelists have emphasized in, in different ways. But this notion of demystifying technology, enhancing the rapidity of decision making, and increasing organizational agility through expansion of skill sets, that to me, and, and I'm, a, I'm a believer that the human element at the end is going to make the difference, I think that's where we ought to be make, making our investments. Because we have, we have apps for, we have apps to get to fifth gen technology. We, we're, we'll get there and we'll do that. And, and we'll fight our way through it if we have to, right? The, the existential innovation the United States has always been, to be frank about it, quite good at um, when push comes to shove. Training our people for the kind of cultural change that I think is necessary in the department, that's a different premise and something that needs real emphasis if we're gonna achieve it. Okay, John? Uh, I would um, re-examine to rewrite uh, statute uh, and regulations that go beyond just the uh, the DOD 5000, the Defense Federal Acquisition Regulations, I, I would rewrite uh, laws that would make it uh, profitable and desirable uh, for uh, American small business, for American innovators uh, to seek out the federal government, uh, to seek out defense uh, for ideas that would be profitable, deliver shareholder value, uh, and contribute uh, all this, these great innovation uh, uh, capabilities uh, to the national defense. Hondo? Talent. Talent. Mm. Amen. Talent. There we go. Because nope. we already have all the authorities we need. I don't need to change. There's, there's no difference in SOCOM and any of the laws, authorities I had to operate there than in the Navy or the Air Force. Big business would sell it different. There's, yeah, I think it's talent. Talent aren't. There's certainly more you could do, but we'll agree to disagree. Talent. Sure. <laughs> Good. That's mm -hmm. what this is for. John Mercy? Fail. 
We, uh, we are an alliance 29 nation, and so uh, each investment we do and uh, exercises and capabilities and everything, we uh, are very risk averse. And because of that, uh, it takes time and we never fail. An example of that is exercises. We invest a lot of money in exercises and it takes 18 months to build an exercise and we do everything in the planning phase mm -hmm. to make the exercise successful. So it is successful, do we learn? Not, not probably what we should learn because we should, try to, to, we, should, we should try to build shorter exercises and fail and we would learn a lot from that. So fail. Okay, Dawn? Uh, talent, I agree with General Scales. This is people on people at the end of the day. Talent, Will? Similar to talent, I would invest to make the term revolving door superlative instead of pejorative. We just have to change the model of working in our business. The people that we want are going to be people in industry that will want to come in and help us and then be able to go back out and come back in and help us so that we're continually refreshing the ideas, the creative thought. And right now we make it damn difficult to get in and out of the government, right? The cooling off periods, the non-competitive agreements, and that's really stymieing the kind of innovation that we can do in the government. So talent matters, but how the talent interfaces between the government and industry also matters. And I would love in future if almost anyone that worked in technology or creative ideas or innovation thought, I'm going to do a, a three-year stint in the government because it's easy. I'm going to work on something important that I would never do anywhere else, and I'm going to make a difference for the world. So I think we would have an amazing draw. Excellent. Kim. Yeah, so I mean, I just want to you know, sort of circle back on the, the strategic and tactical use of data theme a little bit, because I do think that the point that was made earlier, that data is a strategic resource that has critical imperatives at the tactical level, and we need to be able to employ it there. So I would, uh, you know, I would say that we need to make the investment of uh, empowering <coughs> the edge with the right data, the right amount, the right time, in the right context. Uh, to pick up on Hondo's theme of pivot speed, we don't, we don't just need pivot speed in our processes, we need pivot speed in our ability to react and respond uh, and proactively uh, get in front of circumstances and the threats that we have, and we need to do that at the edge. So I think it's about investing in, in empowering the edge, whatever that edge looks like. Elsa? And I'm not in charge of anything right now, so I'll say first, <laughs> looking to the challenge and, the, and looking to the future, I think we have to confront the possibility that the strategic overmatch that we may hope to have or the military technological advantage we have had in recent history may no longer be a reality. China's declared its ambition to be a science and technology superpower and to be a, if not the, world-class military by mid-century, and I think these ambitions should be taken skeptically and, and seriously, uh, skeptically but seriously nonetheless, looking forward and so given that, I think that makes what we've discussed this evening even more important in terms of agility, uh, the capability to pivot, and talent. And I think also looking forward, we need to sustain advances in basic research and try to revitalize STEM education going forward. And I think recognize that even as our competitors come closer to becoming true peer competitors technologically and otherwise, uh, the, human, the human element uh, maintain, remains a critical advantage for us and one where our agility and organizational flexibility may be a continue to be a major advantage if we can sustain that and build upon these initiatives going forward. Bob? Um, try this out. Um, <laughs> during it, we're at a period in our history uh, where we are coming off wars and preparing for the next war. Uh, as a general rule, militaries that transform themselves successfully do it as wars wind down. As we see today, it's a time when you still have resources and you also have time. As a general rule, every nation that's going to compete knows what the, what the technological transformational uh, 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 things will be that will cause you to win the next war. We know that now. 1919, everyone knew that it was the internal combustion engine uh, and the wireless were going to win the next war. So the secret of future victories is not in necessarily refining the technologies, but understanding how best to apply those knowns uh, in such a way that you have the organization, the doctrine, the technology, the training, the leadership built in to fully exploit those. The Germans were successful in the first year and a half of the war because they were best able to apply two fundamental technologies uh, 
uh, best on the battlefield. I would argue, subject to audit, that the modern version of the wireless and the internal combustion engine are unmanned aircraft and unmanned machines. I believe the nation that wins the next war will be the one that applies those most creatively on a future battlefield. What does that suggest to you? Well, uh, one more quick historical fact and I'll shut up. It's, it's, <laughs> called, it's called a machine gun disease. The British Army in 1915 understood that they were slaughtered by German machine guns. And so the question at Salisbury Plain during the spring conference in 1915 was should we increase the proportion of automatic weapons on a future battlefield from 12 to 24? Well, we all know the right answer was 4,000. So we're at a point now where we're nibbling around the edges with technologies that we clearly understand will be the cutting edge of the future. And yet we're still fumbling around with what to do with what we're about to buy and what we're about to build into the forces. Don't fall victim to the machine gun disease. Focus on what's important and come up with everything that goes with it to make sure you employ the technologies better than your opponents do and we'll win the next war. So with that, I wanna, it, there's a microphone in the center here, so if anybody in the audience wants to ask, please step up to the microphone. Um, and while we're getting prepared, let me just give you the rules. One, identify yourself and your organization if you have one. Two, most importantly, it has to be a question. <laughs> please, please ask it in 15 seconds or less. We have time to, uh, to answer. Um, but if you have a question, please line up. While we're getting ready, just one sec. I wanted to ask a question both of Don and Will real quick. Will, you were an HQE at SCO, right? Don, you're an HQE now? Uh, highly qualified? Expert. Expert? I'm a term contractor. Yes. yes. Is this a model that we should be expanding across government to kind of get at what you were talking about, Will? Is that, is that a, 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 a step in the right direction? It, it, it's, it could be, but I mean, okay. that particular authority is, is not as flexible as you would want. Right. The, the thing that is closest is the IPA agreements, the right. interpersonal agreement, where we can bring in people from nonprofits like Lincoln Laboratory, Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. We can white badge them for the government. They're a government employee. But, we have to, but they still retain their salary and benefits from their, from their parent organization because they go back. And then the government, we have to shield them from conflict of interest, not let them misuse working in the government to benefit their parent organization. When I look at that authority, and I look at a Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, and I look at a cutting-edge technology company, I say, well, there's nothing specific about the nonprofit nature. We've, we've spent a lot of money at Johns Hopkins. Why couldn't we bring in someone from a company like Google firewall them away from all the conflict of interest issues in Google, allow them to maintain their Google salary, their benefits, which we just can't compete with, and then allow them to have their talent in the government. Now that would take some bold leadership to do, but I don't see a reason it couldn't be done. We're gonna have to find something like that, because when I talk to people in private industry, they are so interested in the challenges and the problems that we have. That is what's motivating mm. people working in innovation and change today but they can't put their lives on hold. They can't take a year to be hired. They can't have uh, freezing agreements for two years when they go back. And in some cases, just because of family issues, things like healthcare matter. Sure. So we just, we need something creative. So, so I we just went through the HQE, an accelerated HQE process myself. I finished it about three weeks ago and it took me seven months. It took nine and, months for the And I offered, really? I offered to do it for nothing. Don't pay me. And the answer came back, it's so hard to get you to do something for free. Mm -hmm. Please let us pay you. <laughs> um, Don, <laughs> True Don and then Hondo. So, so I, I, I came originally into government as an IPA, and the limitations, it depends on what job you want them to fill. There, there are a bunch of things. HQE is one. SGE is another one that we don't use very, very often. And then in my case, the term contract, in industry, depending on the industry that you're in, that's a very typical thing for seniors, right? And you, you define a job scope, you negotiate a salary, you also negotiate at the same time your goodbye kiss. So if your scope changes, it's no harm, no foul, you just invoke it. That's a very familiar paradigm for seniors in you know, places like AOL and others. And so I think we have lots of tools. It's again about our will and the speed at which we can turn the ship in order to be able to do those things, right? Good. Hondo, and then we're gonna go to questions. Right, go, go to questions. You sure? Yep. Okay. Please uh, identify yourself and ask a real question. Good afternoon, uh, <laughs> Kyle Smith, CEO of Smith's Laboratories. 
Uh, I've spent six years in the Army overseas and with NATO. I have worked with NASA in supersonic research planning. I've worked with the State Department in technology portfolio management. My experience has informed me that innovation requires you to cut against the grain of the organization and highlight the failures of your organization or agency. How do you plan to change the culture of your agency or organization to reward that kind of behavior rather than punishing it? I'll, I'll, I'll take one. That's a great <laughs> question, the, by the way. The number one reportable for, every my, for each of my direct reports is doing something, one major initiative every year that's got at least a 50% chance of failing. And that's the first thing I measure on because I found I can say fail fast all day unless you measure on that. Uh, it's, it's tough. Now, the challenge in public service is no taxpayer wants to know that a dollar they spent hard earned that went to the government wasn't 100% successful. So we also have to be realists that the equation in, in the federal, in public service is a little bit different. That doesn't mean it's wrong or we can't find the right business models, but it's a little bit different. So the, the, I think the other key is how do you get your, your iteration rate up and your iteration cost down? So if I can, don't, if I can figure out in two weeks it won't work, that's a lot more valuable to me than taking two years to figure out what it won't work. And so those are like, you know, focusing on iteration speed and reducing iteration cost. So my cost per fail isn't either in time or money uh, uh, prohibitive, I think is, a, is the approach we're taking anyway. From a personal perspective, protect malcontents. Protect malcontents. As a general rule, the malcontent is usually the one with the best idea. And, and ignore rank. Focus on talent rather than rank. Right. And if you're a general and you're in this business, as I was in my army after next days, stop acting like a general. <laughs> Act like a team member. With the, with, and the other thing is the, the key to innovation to me is not large organizational approaches, but I'm using the starry method for air land battle in my experience with army after next. You build it around a core you build it around a small core of intellectually gifted people, and then you spread out once the idea. But these islands of excellence, I think, from a model, from a programmatic model, over history, particularly as it applies to warfare, whether it's the invention of tanks or the heavy bomber or, uh, or, or uh, the strategic bomber, all of those great innovations came from a very small group of very talented men, uh, nuclear submarines is another one, who were allowed to prosper and were nurtured by a senior leader instead of being crushed by him. So, I'll, I'll, Bob, it's a good point. I'll just point out um, that in the Hacking for Defense program, for us, we teach our students, they have to start with a problem first. Mm -hmm. If there's nothing around which you can galvanize, then we're all kind of just discovering to discover, which is not bad. Many things have come, in, have come from that. But in the defense enterprise, in the national security enterprise, we teach our students, find the problem first and galvanize your innovation efforts around that problem. I think it's working out pretty well. Awesome. Thank you for your question. Thank you all Thank very you. much. That was a great question. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. My name's Chris McNulty from Applied Futures. I've been puzzling. I'm, I'm a great fan of general scales, for one thing. Thank so you, I, I will admit that. Uh, <laughs> however, I'm also a technologist. And the thing that has surprised me about this conversation this afternoon is why are we talking about current technology, essentially, when this conference was about innovation? And it seems to me that we're making an assumption that our future, well, our future adversaries are going to be using, let's call it the equivalent of mass on mass. Why do we assume that they are going to follow our lead in developing weapon systems, platforms, data systems, and so on? I mean, we're already seeing them use things like chemical and biological weapons. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that for adversaries, particularly not wealthy ones, those are the best, cheapest, most effective, most invisible uh, approaches. But no one has spoken about those. That's good oh, I'm point. sorry, you did. That's a good point. Yeah. So I, <laughs> so, so, it's I a mean, good question. I, I, would suggest, I, I, would, I would offer that the last 15 years has, have offered us a lot of evidence, to your point, mm -hmm. um, that sometimes 
uh, we can get lost in the cool stuff that we can discover and build right. uh, that perhaps isn't having the effect that we actually wanted it to have, certainly in the time span and at the cost that we had hoped that it would have. So I, I, and does anybody want to, Will? I'll say one thing. I mean, I think your point is right. Um, we, there are a lot of things that could be fundamentally different, right? We haven't talked about a world of ubiquitous sensors, thousands of satellites in, in LEO. We haven't talked about cyber moving into uh, an AI space where there's a domain of war that's faster than people can ever be involved with. We haven't talked about the onset of quantum sensors and how that could fundamentally change how easy it is to find things that in the past were hard to find. We haven't talked about synthetic biology. We haven't talked about gene editing and what that could do on the biology side of things. Um, all of these things are things that keep me awake at night. But the biggest thing, and I think the reason we've talked about the technology that's in front of us now, is why have we not applied it now? Why are we not a military that is willing to let go of the large, expensive, manned things of the past and create a new military for the future? So at the core of this, I think it's just getting back to embracing change, no matter what it is, as long as it's keeping us current and future. And if we did that, we would earn ourselves to the problems you point out which are the wild cards that could really change the future for us. I mean, admittedly, you know, our, our culture doesn't like to use things like biological weapons or well, those kinds of things. I mean, we, we have a, a much stronger, perhaps moral approach to life. But even so, I mean, there are thousands of things we could be doing on a much smaller, cheaper scale. In this town, it's everyone, I w always would like to let the sacred cow graze a little longer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, I guess I would, I, would, I would disagree to some degree. What we're talking about here is talent, right? So we can argue sure. what that talent needs to be applied to or what that pivot speed needs to be applied to. Or, so I, I kind of go back to the, we can argue which of the 10 things it might be. I don't know. I just want to have a four second pivot to it as fast as we can as we understand it. Thank you very much for Thank your you. question, very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Maggie Feldman Pilch. I'm an SSP student, and I'm also the managing director of Unicorn Strategies. We're a consulting firm that partners young women in national security with senior retired leaders to tackle some of the challenges you have talked about. Um, and to put a very fine point on it, um, I'm wondering how MD5 and other programs like us can actually help us comprehensively hack defense and ensure that we have competent diversity throughout our national security apparatus. How can we stop disincentivizing people who don't fit the traditional mold, especially women and women of color, from contributing? And how do we ensure that they can do more than just show up and stick out and actually be heard? I ask this specifically to this panel, um, and it is a data panel, right? Because it took more than 33 minutes for us to hear from a woman that was not our fearless leader of the SSP program. And unfortunately, women spoke for less than 15 minutes during the two hours? Yeah, so it's a great question, um, and one that I don't know that seizes the department quite the way that it should. Um, I guess with respect to the, to the broader issue, which I'll, I'll try and tackle up front, um, all of us have talked about talent, and all of us have talked about, um, have, talked, have alluded to diversity of talent, but also diversity of intellectual thinking. Right? And whether or not you're talking about race or gender or you're talking about geography, I think all of those things sort of pool into and point to the notion that if the department is going to find, is, is going to change the way that it thinks and thus the way that it makes decisions, then I think it goes to this notion that both Will and, and Hondo and others have, have alluded to, that, then we have to find a way to increase the permeability between the department that we are and the community that we live amongst and figure out how to pull more of that community into our decision-making process. I'd like to think, and uh, I'm, not, I'm not totally convinced that this is yet the case, I'd like to think that MD5 helps to break down some of those barriers, um, not just with programs like Hacking for Defense, but with some of the programming that we have inside of our collaboration vertical that specifically designs collision events between the warfighter, between warfighters who are gonna interact with college students, right? I had a very interesting interaction with someone from DAU just about a week and a half ago 
Um, and we were talking about problem solving and, and reforming business processes. And the, the, this particular SES happened to mention almost in passing, well, look, we, we, we're, we're really interested in this hackathon concept, right? This notion of, this notion of pulling together these non-traditionals, but you know, we want to make sure that we vet these folks, right? We don't want anybody like living in the, you know, somebody, some kid living in his mom's basement. And I said, well, it's interesting that you mentioned that because likely it's not that kid, boy or girl living in his mom's basement is probably the one that has the solution to your problem set. Right? But until we get out and we talk to people where they are, I'm not sure that the department's going to crack that code. But I'm hopeful that things like MD5 work towards that end. Don, did you want to? Yeah, I do. Uh, so uh, I'll, I'll come at it two different ways. One is that I actually baseline our diversity metrics against competent technical companies commercially. I don't baseline us against the rest of the USG. No offense. Right? <laughs> and what I will say is that, Thank you. <laughs> that we are on par. That doesn't mean that we have solved this, but if, if you, and I know you're paying attention to it based on this, the stats that you cited, right? We have a big problem kind of at the junior high level, particularly with women and women of color, that it's not cool to be good in science and technology. But what we can do is at least look at our peer group, right? And then we have to work that problem. The second thing that I would say is be careful you don't walk into the measuring our success as women by the rules that are dictated by the people that we see typically around us, right? If I'm impactful and I can do that with brevity, but I carry the room, then that's not the right metric to use, right? And I think we can't play into that game. No, I'd certainly agree with you. I just cite it because unfortunately, I mean, and I actually wrote down in my notes, I was impressed by how impactful the women were. <laughs> uh, let, let, let me just push back for a minute. I'm not gonna let you get away. <laughs> We've had this conversation uh, before. I'm ready for when it. I, <laughs> when, when I first started in this business, and I've been in it a long time, the defense intellectual business, the national security policy making business in, in the early 90s, you get into a room like this and there would not be a single female, zero. It was a 100% man's club. Recently, as I've gone around, I was at a national security seminar at West Point about three weeks ago uh, that was run by the uh, Modern Warfare Institute. And I would venture to say, at least in terms of the speakers, I counted heads. It was slightly more than half were women. And probably 40% of the audience was women. Um, so, and, and there are many reasons for it. I won't go into those. But I would say that the at least the female voice in national security is heard more distinctly today than it's ever been before. And then I'll also say, I'm going out of limb here, that the female voice, particularly in things like civil military relations, uh, uh, the impact of cultural national security policy making, um, and various other subjects where women tend to concentrate has been transformed by uh, gifted uh, female intellectuals in our business. We're not where we should be right now, but I gotta tell you, over the last 25 years, we've really come a long way. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Andrew McMillan from National Defense University. I work at the International Student Management Office. As someone who's just starting their career, you've all emphasized talent this evening. What would you recommend to cultivate talent in that hybrid business government uh, sphere, especially as someone who's maybe skeptical of the return on investment of, say, grad school or? <laughs> <laughs> so we always tell people to, to learn their craft and get really, really good at something because you'll never be allowed to grab the table, um, however you measure that unless you actually bring real competence to the conversation, right? So that's kind of that, and that doesn't take a graduate degree. I happen to have one, but that's, you know, I started working right after I finished my bachelor's up. And then from there, then it will also, if you're competent, you'll get people that present you opportunities. And then I always say, do what you love with a great team, and it's almost like you don't have to go to work every day, right? So that's my, you know, I have four boys. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would say the ante, the ante to the table is competence and values, right? If you don't have competence and values, you'll, you can't get to the table. And then I, would, I, I look for three things of those folks that I think are really the folks that can transform 
uh, your organization, like for curiosity, right? So are you interested in more than just what's two feet on one side of you? Are you making relationships, right? I look for initiative. So you're curious, you get an idea, you have the initiative to go take it on. And then persistence, you don't wilt at the first contact with the bureaucracy that tells you you're all wrong. And the folks that I think that's probably a common trait amongst uh, a lot of folks, not that this is a great leadership panel, it's just some, some folks trying to do a good job for the country. Uh, but you, those three skills and honing those can really, that's what I'm looking for, uh, for those leaders coming up through the ranks. Thanks for your question. Well, I, just so we're clear, we're running out of time, so we're probably not going to be able to get to everybody. We probably have time for two, three questions at the most left. Uh, Nate Hughes, I've been failing a lot this semester as one of Chris and Matt's uh, Hacking for Defense students. Um, <laughs> quick context for my question, I'll be super quick. Um, we're working the social media problem for the Marine Corps, and needless to say, it's been a fascinating semester to be working on social media. You know, we, we figure out that technology is not the problem while reading about Cambridge Analytic on our phones. Um, so the question is, you know, we're hearing all this stuff in our interviews about there's not enough information operations personnel you have to do a counterintelligence policy to use social media in certain ways, and then we open our phones, and there's a dozen high school students from one school in Florida dominating the entire country's social media conversation. And it's all them, and it's like, wait, the Marine Corps has literally three divisions of high school graduate digital natives. So when we're thinking about social media at the tactical edge where most of these high school graduates work, how do you recommend we think about that observation and communicate it back meaningfully to the Department of Defense? Well, you used the T word, so I guess I'll lead off. That's a great question, by the way. Uh, absolutely right. I think there are two elements involved here. What, the first and the most important is trust. Um, when seniors trust people at the tactical level, that dialogue, that chatter that you're talking about, I think that's what you're talking about, is very rich and very informative and very effective. Um, and so data information moves up and down and laterally. The more those in authority trust those to, 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 to chatter. Uh, and, 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 and I guess the, the second thing is the importance of sharing. Sharing from the bottom up, not necessarily from the top down. And we do, we're getting better at it, but we have never done as well at that uh, as perhaps we should. I would assure you that the team chatter uh, over cell phones by the Taliban is probably a bit richer than in a Marine Corps battalion. Thanks, Nate. Hi, my name is Steve Kendricks. I'm a MBA candidate at the McDonough School of Business. Uh, a lot of you have talked a lot about uh, how do you educate the force. Honda, you talked about uh, getting soldiers trained at the lowest level, which is excellent. A lot of you talked about externships. Uh, but isn't there also a problem um, at the senior leadership levels? I'm talking about your peers. Um, personally, I've seen leaders at the highest levels of the Army get kind of blinkered by uh, sophisticated sounding BS from contractors, uh, you know, probably talking about blockchain or lasers or machine learning AI, I don't know. But how do you, and, and, that, and their decisions have put my soldiers in danger on the field. So what do you do now to protect yourself from people like that who essentially just use it as a way to get the next contract? Yeah, I'm not gonna answer go the question. That. I, I gotta tell you a funny thing. There's an old saying that generals are like bass. They're drawn to bright, shiny objects. And I think that answers your, your point. And it's very well taken. John? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. And it gets to this idea of uh, bringing uh, two different uh, value paradigms together. Right? So uh, in defense, we, we monetize uh, success in completely different ways than business people do. Right? So you know, there's a. There's a pejorative lilt to what you're talking about when you talk about contractors who are trying to bring something into the sphere of capabilities and presenting it to blinkered senior officials, right? So they're blinkered because they're talking two different languages. So one of the things that we're trying to do, one of the things that uh, is actually present in the Eisenhower School uh, is the incorporation of industry into the program. It's how, it's how the, the uh, War College got started in 1924 after the nation's 
uh, very tragic attempt to mobilize in World War I. And so there was, there was a lot of um, uh, real heavy internal examination about uh, industry, how we mobilize industry, about the presence of a, uh, a maritime shipping capability. We built a lot of stuff. It never got over to France because it sat on the ports because we didn't have our own maritime fleet. A whole bunch of examinations, but that's how it all started. And it, and it was the Army Industrial College, and they would go out to different depots and plants and try to understand industry. And, that, and we were largely successful in World War II because we had given that a lot of thought. So, uh, so that's present in the Eisenhower School. We go out and we have an uh, industry study program uh, that we do uh, every spring. Right now, the students are actually out internationally uh, examining 20 different industrial sectors. We're also supposed to have, by the authorization of Congress, industry fellows in the class. I'm supposed to have 20 industry fellows right now in, the, in this year's class of 18. I have one. Um, and so that is some demonstration of a breakdown of the conversation between uh, our, our nation's defense in the form of uh, the Department of Defense and then her commerce. And so, but it is, it, it is getting to, to have folks understand as they transition to become senior leaders, the language of business. So how to understand a P&L. You know, how to understand return on investment, cost of capital, barriers to entry, export control, how to understand the cost of compliance. All of these things that really bring senior leaders to the fore so that we're not blinkered when we're looking at that next new shiny thing uh, in a way that helps us be able to understand value uh, in, in how we're going to be able to bring the capabilities out to the tactical edge now and how we're going to be able to generate strategic overmatch in the future. But it's two different languages that we need to uh, uh, bring those two communities together. I, if, if, I, if I may, real quick, I, one of the challenges that government has today, and I think, Kim, you'll appreciate this, uh, as will everybody, but government really is, no kidding, at an asymmetric information disadvantage against industry. Industry spends a bajillion dollars on um, uh, uh, data analysis and tools to sort of allow them to blinker senior officials, right? If government had the same capability, th that advantage would go away and we'd be having a real conversation about needs and what I'm willing to pay for it, uh, uh, or, or, or an offering and what I'm willing to pay for it. Um, I, it so, they've, I, in, 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 a, in a market perspective, they've invested, the industry's invested a lot more in those tools to get that asymmetric information advantage. And I think government really, really, really needs to make sure that it can overcome that so it's not getting fleeced. And I say that as a contractor, <laughs> blasphemy, I know. So, Chris, can I also say that if somebody does that to my boss and I have contracts with them, we have a personal conversation afterwards, right? Um, and and that's, it's like, you wanna keep doing business with us, don't ever do that again, right? I think that's where rapid prototyping also helps. So prove it and let the, let the soldiers prove it as opposed to let the PowerPoint chart prove it. And so again, if we, that, I think that's good for everybody to get actual more stuff. Folks get feedback and then we can actually- General Mercy, sorry, Hunter. Uh, no, no, everything has been said. And uh, what we try to do is uh, to, we, we try to organize a uh, uh, much better relationship between all the different of the, uh, all the different levels and the different nations. And it's a, a two-way street. One, one, one part of it is to try to bring the industry uh, in our main exercises at different levels so they much better understand our requirements. And, uh, and uh, the other way is uh, for us to, uh, to try to uh, um, organize many events in which we can listen to the industry and, and, and listen to them, listen to what, what, what is possible. But it has to be very well prepared and put some real topics on the, on the, on the table. This is what we do regularly. So we can, uh, the good thing is, uh, we, uh, when we do that, uh, we start with brainstorming. And one of the key issue for us is uh, there is always a competition between the nations. And uh, to avoid this competition, we need to, be, uh, to, 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 to put problems that are a bit forward. So, so if we do short term, they are all in competition. That's difficult, but if we do, longer term thinking, then we can share a lot of information. Thanks for your question. Did, you. Let me just ask the panel, I know we've been here for a while, we only have a couple, can, you, can we power through these last few people? Is that okay for everyone? Sure. Thank you very much for that. 
All right, hello everyone, thank you for coming. My name is Zach Klein. I'm a student in the Security Studies program. I'm also in the Hacking for Defense class, and I'm a former US Army Infantry NCO. My question is specifically about close combat lethality, so I'll ask it to you, General Scales. Um, in my experience, technology can provide an advantage, but poorly assimilated technology can actually increase friction and the fog of war. Uh, two things are happening right now in the services, specifically in the ground combat components. The complexity of tactical level mission sets are increasing, and the time to train soldiers is decreasing. How do these organizations need to change culturally in the way that they approach time and talent management and training to compensate for that fact? It's a great question. First of all, the days of Willie and Joe are over. Um, it takes, by our estimation, at least two years to build a fully functioning, uh, tightly bonded small unit. Uh, you'll be pleased to know that uh, the Army is now going to increase its time for basic training uh, from 14 to 21 weeks because they, they realize that. Um, but also your point uh, about matching man with, with machine, which is what we're about here, is spot on. All too often, charlatanism and favoritism takes over what we put in the soldiers' hands. And what's so obvious, or Marines' hands, what's so obvious to me is how often you go into a supply room and see box after box of high-tech uh, gizmos and gadgetries that the soldiers don't use. Someone said here earlier, the best way to prove a weapon system is to put it in the hands of soldiers rather than to put it on a PowerPoint slide. I think, we're, I think our team is making progress. I can't promise anything. But the one big thing we have is, number one, you're there to ask the question, and number two, we have a Secretary of Defense who believes in what you and I are saying. And thanks for your question. Thanks, sir. Thanks, Zach. Hi, uh, yeah, my name is Utsav Sanduja. Um, so I'm, I'm the uh, chief operating officer of a social media site called Gab. It's a pro First Amendment site. Uh, so the question is, so we, we've been talking about how the private sector and government can work harmoniously together. I would like your opinions on what you think of like uh, hostile state actors and hostile non-state actors that are playing a very deep and disturbing information war using the kind of generosity and uh, good you know nature of you know free market enterprises like ours for example in an attempt to advance their causes for perhaps nefarious reasons or what not this might be more a CIA directed question or NATO directed <laughs> question love to have your thoughts thank you I'll let the general go first. <laughs> Please go first. <laughs> I knew this would be a hard one. I think there's a lot of um, public education, and, and one of the things that when Chris asked the question, it's not the first thing that I would, but I think we have to think through the implications of the classification systems that we put in place. Um, there are a lot of things that I think we could share lessons learned on that uh, we associate very quickly with operational prerogatives that maybe don't need to be, right? Which then puts us into a classification bind. So I think there are some opportunities there that we have to take advantage of in um, overclassification of technical sorts of things, right? Um, is one of the, the areas where, and I think we've made progress maybe from a cybersecurity standpoint, but I think the social media aspects that you raise are exactly down the line of where that's the next place that we're gonna have to try and think that through. I, that really didn't answer your question other than to help admire the problem, and I recognize <laughs> that. But. I just want to say that there are good Samaritans out there that really do want to help the government and really do make sure that you know, our democracy doesn't get taken over by hostile mm -hmm. actors. Mm -hmm. so, so I think, and, and one of the I think, things we we're really trying to work at at SOCOM as I was leaving is, um, how do we harness that uh, talent uh, and goodwill and um, and use that not in a not always in a traditional customer supplier right. perspective. Right. How do we create, say, an anonymous Dropbox that you know you find there's a hack out there that you can just say, hey, this is out there. Maybe you guys want to clean this up um, because you found it, or because again, you all want to have a free nation. That doesn't mean you want to be under a government contract, right? And so I think there's some pretty and there's some work going on right now of this. Where do we create those connection zones? that are um, completely neutral, um, and it's not business transaction-based as much as kind of shared interest-based. 
I think there's a lot we can do in that to actually take it to a next level um, where it isn't just a, hey, you're coming for a contract or, or all that other kind of stuff. Um, I think there's, you know, the challenge, I think what I worry about is as a percentage of the population that our military is, is getting smaller and smaller, all right, either military experienced or have somebody in the family. There's a larger percentage of the country that really wants to help the military and has absolutely no idea how, yeah. right? And then even if you knew how, we make it really hard, right? Uh, and so how do we leverage the folks? How do we leverage, back to the diversity question, how do we leverage the incredible diversity of the larger and larger percentage of the country that isn't part of the military? And that's, that is a strategic opportunity for us because we're doing pretty good with not doing it as well as we should. To me, that's great opportunity space. Uh, and I think there's a lot of really interesting things we could do that way. And then that gets shared, learning, shared, understanding, and builds the relationships that, that we need. Kim, did you want to add something? Yeah, sure. Um, so it's a very interesting point. Uh, you know, so anything that's created for good can also be used for ill. Uh, so I think, again, getting back to the point that I made earlier about the strategic use of data or the thing, uh, I think it's incumbent upon anybody who's creating uh, or innovating something to consider the ill that it could cause if we're not careful or if we're not, if we don't employ some appropriate protection. I mean, there, there's many examples of that. You could point to the data analytics example uh, as one, one example of that. So, so I, I guess I would just leave it at that. Anything that's innovated for good can also be used for ill. And if those that are concerned about uh, service uh, and the service by which their particular solution is going to be applied, uh, we should think about the potential uh, adverse applications that could come into play as well. John, did you want to add something? Or? Yeah, the only thing I, I would highlight is you, you talked about value. So we talked about a number of things here uh, tonight, uh, you know, talent and, and, and a lot in this great power competition context uh, is, uh, you know, geopolitics, uh, geopolitics and uh, economics and then this competition for technology and strategic overmatch. But at the end of the day, the, the great power competition, really, we all have to think about the degree to which it is about values. Uh, and the way that we have a, um, a value system of a, of a liberal society, an open society, democracy, uh, and malign actors uh, around the world who, in which w were in competition, uh, do not. And they, their world's very easy. They wake up every morning and, and, and figure out how to uh, get advantage relative to us. And there's a lot of challenges in what you just talked about in terms of how we're going to secure our nation but maintain all of our liberties, maintain our great democracy and so forth. But you know, people should not make any mistake about this, what this great competition is about over time. And we would do well to think about uh, our values and our value system as a society. It's a good question. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Okay, I, I, don't, I think everybody's gonna die here soon. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm Marco Di Capua. I'm actually in the faculty of National Defense University at the College of International Security Affairs. I'm a physical scientist, that detailed from the National Nuclear Security Administration. And my question is, <coughs> given the fact that you have such economies of scale in systems like Google Cloud and Amazon Cloud, is how can the U.S. government develop trust with these organizations to actually be able to process very highly sensitive data? We actually have a contract, and the guy who's responsible for it is sitting here in the audience someplace tonight. Where are you, Doug? Um, we just put it on-prem there. He's over there. Uh, so we actually can, can do it today. Excellent. Thank you. And we have, to, we have to have those trust relationships with those organizations because those are very, very important technologies for us. So it's, it's really just a matter of setting up the appropriate trust relationship. Thank you, sir. For your question. Clay, you're the last person, honest to goodness. All right, Chris. Uh, <laughs> thanks, everyone, for a great night uh, and good evening. I'm Lieutenant Colonel Clay McGuire from JIDO, uh, vested interest in AI and machine learning, and so I'm going to bring us back to that real quick, um, especially in light of the, you know, the advances that, that, that China's making, the aggressive stance that they've taken towards AI. Um, uh, Dr. Mike, uh, um, uh, the, the new ATNL. 
Griffin. Oh, Griffin. Dr. Yeah, Mike, Mike Griffin, Griffin just announced uh, the Joint AI Center as an idea. We've had a little bit of discussion today about uh, you know the service is really holding holding all the money. Um, is that a good idea? Is that a place that a direction we can go uh, to bring AI together? I'm gonna take a while. Sure. I mean. Uh, I'm, I think anyone up here would say we're for anything that's increasing <laughs> the, you know, the technology advantage that our operators have. And, and AI is underrepresented in our budget. So anything that increases that is, is going to start by being a step in the right direction. I think, I think the big point that, that all of you need to know taking away is the one that Kim made. That even if we had it, we're not building systems that feed it. Our data stays trapped and dormant where it's produced. In some cases, it's not kept. And it's because when we build things, we're not thinking about them at an architecture level. So the thing we have to do is start thinking about the systems we build in that networked context. We need to put computers and storage on things even before we have a need for it because we know we'll find a way to use it. And that's simply not how acquisition works today, but it ought to. So it's a good step. But the job that a lot of us have to do is make sure it can be fed with the data to make it live and breathe and evolve at the pace of relevance. And today we don't have that. We go to war today, only our people are going to learn. They're going to be the thing that's going to be smarter on day two. We have to change that. And I guess my only point would, you know, not a pure centralized model for that is not, I think, sufficient. So again, how do we demystify it and enable it at the point of need, not just in a centralized, I mean, there's good in in some synergy there, but, but that's uh, necessary but not sufficient. Thanks, Clay. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. So Thank before you we leave tonight, um, the reason we're all here tonight and the reason it all came together is because of Jordan Moeny. Is, where, is Jordan still here? So mm. she's a rock star. The, she organized all of this. I want to thank our Hacking for Defense class, our students who are making this whole thing happen, Matt Zace, Pete Newell, who's in the back. And please join me in thanking everybody up on the stage tonight for an informative, important meeting.